as a play. This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright. And you're listening to The Krypton Report. And you're listening to Krypton Report. Kryptonian podcast, including Superman and Supergirl. We discuss games, movies, cartoons, TV shows, and comics. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Welcome to the Krypton Report. Today's episode is going to be fun because we have some extra people with us. As always, there is the man of might, the muscles upon muscles. The man whose own weights racked themselves at the gym. We're talking about Mr. James Cole. How's it going, James? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty good. How's it going, Tyler? I have a little bit of a head cold, and yes, people, it is a head cold. Believe me, this is day three, and I'm almost out of it. And I, I, I know my body with colds. Since the, wet, the temperature changed, it was 59 this morning when we decided to go on our morning hike. Um, yeah, so it happens. Yeah. But oh, yeah. so that voice? It's, it's, it's not like it's not like me. Couple, you know, I actually did have it for a couple like of weeks there. You hear that, James? There's somebody else here. You want to say hi? Who are you guys? Uh, Who's there? Me is me Solomon. It's me Kayla. That's right. Today's episode. Hi. Today's episode, we are going to review Superman: Man of Tomorrow. The newest animated film from the DC film, animated films. And Solomon wanted to talk, and Sailor wanted to talk with us. We've watched it twice now, haven't we, guys? We haven't watched two times. Yeah, we've watched it two times. Mm -hmm. How, it, it, it was a really good movie. I think my favorite part... Wait, hold on, hold on. Hold on, we'll get there. How many times have you watched it, James? Uh, I watched it twice. Okay, so James has watched it twice as well. Now, I will say in honor of this film, I am drinking a cup of coffee um, from my Superman coffee maker with my Superman coffee mug that has a touch of cinnamon in it. Because it really wakes the grounds up. Yeah, it does actually. It does pretty well. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um... You think it's really great? Yeah, yeah, me too. Solomon keeps saying we have to watch it with Mommy, and we were going to, but we ran out of time before we could do the podcast. Um, so here, here's, we're actually recording this on the yeah. 5th, yeah, which is my brother's birthday. Happy birthday to my brother who never listens to this show. Um, and what's odd is Amazon actually shipped yeah. me the physical copy early. It's not even supposed to, physical copy is not supposed to drop till the 8th. Um, so it's pretty crazy. Right. So, but we've had a chance to enjoy the film, and one thing I'm gonna tell you, James, right off the bat, is from the physical copy. Remember how after uh, Flashpoint Paradox, they started putting characters on the binding on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Even for non-continuity films. Like. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're not doing that anymore. Oh no! No, it's now like a like a picture snip snapshot from the film itself on the binding. Hmm. So, so that's different. And, and oh, and Gary, 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 so, uh, before we get started on the review, we're going to talk about just a little news. There's not a whole lot other than coming soon. This weekend is going to be Fandom Part Two on the twelfth. Yay! <laughs> and I was like sitting the other day, and I was like, "Man, like they haven't said or done anything for this yet." And then all of a sudden, yesterday, popping up on Facebook and Twitter, and um, they start promoting it. And I'm happy because they have a filter now that you can ties to your Instagram, Facebook, or Snapchat that like comicifies like your face with like inside a Batman comic, which I was like cool because I'm not a Snapchat person. And when I do try to get on there and find filters, I have a horrible luck yeah. because supposedly there were supposed to be some filters from fandom last time, and I could not find them. So I'm just glad I, it actually I didn't, has filters for I things didn't I see use. them. 
Um, yeah, I, 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 after you said something about it, I looked and I didn't see him. So I don't know. Snapchat has a certain place for a certain people, and you can argue with me about it off mic, people. Um, also, today, Sayla announced the winner of our quick giveaway for the digital copy. It was our good friend Ray over at uh, Last Sons of Krypton. Sayla announced it on our Instagram today, so that was fun. Congratulations, Ray. And then the only other piece of, like, real news is um, it's being reported that Supergirl Season 6 is going to start filming. And I'm pulling it up now from Krypton Reports. <coughs> webs or not Krypton Report from Krypton Sites website is they're going to begin filming here September 28th, which is weird that they're going to be filming September 28th, but it's not going to pre premiere uh, till mid-season. And it says the premiere will be directed by Jess Warren, and it says it will be done April 5th. So I don't know if it's from September 28th, which ironically is my mother's birthday, um, through April 5th is when they're filming. or if I believe that's what it was. And that means that, you know, sometime, you know, when will it premiere, considering that nothing is starting um, until next year. And then... Well, I, last I saw, The Flash is supposed to be starting to film about September 22nd. Which because is, as we, you know, as you know, if you pay a little bit of attention to things, uh, Canada is doing very, very well under... Um, under this pandemic, um, and they've turned things around pretty heavily, um, and uh, they're they're getting things uh, back on track and 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 getting people to be able to go back to work and even start to film uh, their these CW shows. Yeah, but, but but my thing is is it's talking about the Supergirl starting to film then, but the show doesn't premiere till mid season, and it talks about. Legends isn't supposed to start filming until October 5th, and it looks like it's going to have 22 episodes, and it's supposed to premiere in January. But Supergirl is supposed to be a mid-season, so we're looking at probably 13 to 16 episodes for this season. Well, you know, when it comes to when it comes to TV and these shows, most TV shows, and that, I mean that even kind of, that even includes the half-hour shows, let alone the the 45-minute ones. Um, it takes it takes eight days just about to film an episode. So you know, with an episode, excuse me, with an episode released every seven days, uh, typically, I mean, you know, that's what that's what breaks are for and everything during um, during the holidays and sport and the big sporting events and things like that. Um, <clears throat> they they need to get on the ball beforehand for for them to have time to record, but them to also be able to put these shows into post-production before they can be aired. So, and then, I mean, I guess that means Superman and Lois should begin filming, because so I know it was supposed to start in September as well sometime. So, but that's about I all I wonder news. how many episodes that show is going to have. <laughs> yeah, but we get two super shows, and they both have maybe 16 episodes. I'm good with that. Yeah. You have new Solomon? So, Jamie, do you want the, the Snyder Cut of Justice League? Uh, the trailer? Yes. Yes, I have. Probably like 35 times. Well, Solomon, <laughs> okay? Solomon makes sure that everyone who comes to our house watches it. We've shown <laughs> TT. We've shown Good job, Nina. Solo. So, we're very proud of Solomon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Getting the word out there. And, and I, I, the, the one more person I want to see is, it's, it's my, my grand, my other grandma. Yeah. Yeah, my mom. Yeah. In the words of Kevin Smith, Solomon's doing the Lord's work. Yeah. And, and yeah, I want to have a Superman night with all my family. Yep. We're going to have a family Superman night. He said that today, and I'm like, yeah! <laughs> Funny excuse to watch more Superman. So, with 
without further ado, let's jump into this film. Um, quick, so let's look at it real quick here. I'm pulling it up. Um, just some background. Superman Man of Tomorrow is directed by Chris Palmer, who is uh, new to DC. He's done the Voltron series that's on Netflix. He's directed a lot of those, which I highly recommend anyone checking out. It's a great reboot of Voltron. It was written by Tim Sheridan, who also wrote Reign of the Superman. And then the voice cast is Darren Chris as Superman Clark Kent, who um, people might know as he was the music meister on the Supergirl Flash crossover. Yeah, in the musical crossover episode. Zachary Quinto as Lex Luthor. You know, Zachary Quinto from Heroes and the Star Trek. Who would love it? <laughs> I'm getting there, buddy. I'm getting there. Ike Amade as Martian Manhunter. Eugene Bird as Ron Trope. Eugene was uh, Diggle's brother, Andy Diggle on Arrow. Brett Dalton was Parasite slash Rudy Jones. He was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, Ryan Hurst was Lobo. Ryan Hurst being Ope from Sons of Anarchy. So this guy, Solomon, right here. And then as Lois Lane was Alexandria Diodario. And I will tell you right now, for the most part, this voice cast could almost do live action. Um, Superman's dad, Jonathan, was provided by Neil Flynn, most famous for playing the janitor on Scrubs. Oh, awesome. And his... M I didn't notice that was him. I did not notice that was him. Bellamy Young was Martha. And, let's see. She has done... She's done things. Uh, let's see if she's done anything I've seen. Um, she was in an episode of Castle. A lot of TV, like one-offs. Uh, but yeah, she's worked. She was in one episode of Supernatural. So, yep, CW, tie-in, um, a lot of TV work. So, good for her. Oh, she was Rachel in Mission Impossible 3. That was like, going backwards, that was the first, uh, film role I see on here. So, and she was in, man, this is old. We Were Soldiers as Catherine Metzger. Um, oh, wow. But all I'm going to say is, yeah, for the most part, I think everybody in this voice cast can play the roles live action and be and be awesome. Well, the, the guy who played Perry White doesn't quite exactly look like him, that's for sure. That, that's a, be a, yeah. a lot younger version of Perry White if that was the case. Um, so what do you want to say, Solomon? The... Parasite's just in the one movie. But yeah, um, I mean... When, yeah, it comes, when it comes to the voice cast, the actor who also um, did the voice for uh, Perry White, uh -huh. um, just as a, a, a nod since, we, since it just came out and we both loved it, um, he provided the added dialogue for Rufus from Bill and Ted 3 Face the Music. Yes, he so did. So whatever, whatever they couldn't port over from from the original two films um, to to build Rufus's dialogue, he provided. He also and was. The, you couldn't tell the difference. Oh no, it you was, couldn't. It was great. He was also the voice of Scroll on Wizards, which we just got done watching the DreamWorks animation Wizards which is the third volume of the Troll Hunter series, which I highly recommend. Um, he also provided the voice of Bruno Mannheim, Calabac, Perry White on Justice League Action, which, pulling this back around, the score for this film was done by, I have it here in my notes, uh, Mr. Ripple. And he did the recent Deathstroke movie, 
Constantine City of Demons, uh, the Batman with the Ninja Turtles, and uh, Justice League action, as well as Batman, all the Batman Unlimited stuff. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> excuse me, pretty pretty good pedigree all around of our performance. <coughs> Sailor, you have to be quiet. So, with that being said, let's jump into the film. Um, the film definitely takes a lot of inspiration. Like it's a, it's not based off any certain storyline, but you can tell that it has remnants of Secret Origin, Birthright, and American Alien. I read two of the three. <laughs> I have not read American Alien yet. I did when it first came out, and I just remember liking, like, one of the issues. I don't remember which one. Um, I'm going to revisit it soon. But I just being, like, not super impressed. And there's, like, maybe, like, one or two of the issues I liked. Um, but I, I, know, I just, read I remember it. I remember when it was announced and it was coming, and they announced it on um, USA Today. Uh, in the USA Today newspaper, and you know, I read the article, so I mean, I've known of it since before, you know, before it came out, but um, never, never have I gotten around to to reading that because it was, you know, written by Max Landis, um, who had that big moment where he had his scripts being picked up, and he was a hot commodity, and then all of a sudden, like his scripts that were picked up were then like changed, altered. And then in his movies that did get produced were kind of flops, and then he kind of just, like, disappeared. But before we get into the f details of the film, let's let uh, Solomon, why don't you go ahead and just tell us how you felt about the movie altogether before James and I break it down. James, I, I, felt, the movie, I felt the movie, I think the movie was really good. I liked the new villain. Parasite. The, yeah, the villain parasite. Yeah. What else? What didn't you like about it, buddy? I didn't like that he died. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't like that he turned to a zombie stuff. Yeah, his his transformation was he was he was pretty uh, almost demonic <laughs> in his transformation. Before he went like complete monster. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Solomon. All right. You wanna go and play sissy, and me and Jay will just finish up. Did you say what you gotta say? Yeah. No. Okay. You wanna stay? He wants to stay. He wants to stay. All right. So I like the film opens up. Well, first of all, like, what did you think of the animation style? Um, I mean, you know, go, go all the way back to the beginning, like the stills and stuff. It was like, looks like Archer animation. Um, once Very we saw flash, it in mo flash style. Yeah. And then, and then once, once we saw it in motion, it was, a, you know, could tell it was, it was a bit different, um, from, from the clip and the clip in the trailers. Um, but then when the, uh, when the the film came out here, um, there's a <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> my voice is cracking. Um, it was puberty's uh, tough, man. Third puberty, was, you know, I, it's tough. <laughs> right, we go, we go third, third puberty. Again. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the animation for the most part was like it was really smooth. Um, it was really clean. Uh, there were some bits during the action that looked like, um, I don't know, they had a hard time animating what they were trying to, to show. Um, just, just some of the flips and some of the interactions and like when Superman was hit back by, by the gigantic parasite, the Godzilla parasite, and, and he was like flipping again, flipping through the air and then he hit the wall and like flipped. And then it was weird because, like, he, he flies back, he hits the wall, and then he flips off of the wall. And it's kind of like two incredibly fast front flips as he's falling to the ground. And then it's like 
two incredibly fast flips, and then he's flat until he hits the ground. So it was kind of weird, but yeah, just a couple of things I noticed like that. But um, for the most part, the animation was really smooth. It's really clean. Um, Martian Manhunter in his different forms looks really good. Um, you know, Superman looks good. He he almost has like a Brandon Ralph build. Right. You know? I was thinking about that too. And, 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 uh, why did Lobo fight with prison men? Right. I was going to get there. Yeah, we'll get there, buddy. Um, so Lobo is in the film. And yeah. His animation, like, I like Lobo. I, I know you don't. You're, you're not like, um, uh, an anti-hero um, type of character. Um, See, look, people. He, <laughs> pe- look, there is something that James and I don't agree on. Okay, for all you listeners out there, like Tyler and James, just agree on everything. Uh, no, we don't. Yeah, no, we don't. Uh, Tyler is not like the biggest fan of Deadpool because he's like an anti-hero. Um, who else we got? Uh, Lobo's one of them, and Lobo really only in the last, you know handful of years has been like in an anti-hero position before he was mostly like a villain um because too many of our villains anymore we want to make them into anti-heroes because they get popular right um and and you know he was he's always been a bounty hunter but the and being a bounty hunter is like he he could ride the line of being an anti-hero or just a villain, but, you know, coming from his background, like, he's a genocidal maniac. He killed his entire race, and, and, he, and he wipes out his children. He wipes out any, any parts of him that, that try to regenerate into another one of him. Like, he, he only can accept one Zarnian and one of him. Like, <laughs> Yep. Now, Solomon, you had a comment on an anti-hero. What do you want to say? That that Red Hood's an anti-hero, too. Yes, he is. We know that. So. And that's an anti-hero that Daddy, because of you, has actually really started to like. Yeah. Uh, well, they've definitely given Jason Todd his due in the last um, in the last number of years since Under the Red Hood came out, the the show or the the movie. Your favorite Robin or your favorite Bat Family character because he's Red Hood? My favorite Bat Family character. All right. <laughs> yeah, because Red Hood's my favorite. We have the Max. We do. For, for Arkham Knight. But, all right. So now we'll get into the film proper, okay? You'll have to bear with us. James and I aren't used to this. It's only 5 o'clock, people, and we're recording. And that's not usually James and I's cup of tea, so we're getting used to this kind of thing. So, Well, you know, it's kind of cool, you know, that we're not, like, real tired. And, you know, by the end, we're just like, okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's nice. Um, so the film opens up where Clark is watching... Um, a horror movie, like a 50s B movie, where the villain turns out to be an alien and just starts crying. And I thought that was a really interesting place to start. And he doesn't have glasses. And then Jonathan picks him up. And in the next part, um, we see him with glasses. They don't specify, but I'm assuming it was at Pete Ross's house. (laughs) That's a good hit, Ken, and I'm behind that. But it was a boy. Yeah, it certainly wasn't Lana. It should have been Lana, but um, and they only looked like they were like twelve, thirteen years old too, maybe. You know. Yep. I agree. Because because I of agree. the neck because of the next scene where 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 jo- uh, Jonathan is talking to Martha and Clark has his glasses on and he's playing with his little his little pyramid. <laughs> so the cube reminded me kind of like like the birthright um, their um, tablet thing he had. So right. The, um, 
um, yeah, they, 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 they reveal that off screen, Jonathan and Martha before the movie even picked up before that night, um, that they had told him potentially, or that they told him what he was, that they, that they found him rocket ship, that he's an alien. Um, and that's what freaked him out by watching the movie. And then that's, and then they gave him that cube that must have come with him. And, you know, like he's, he's playing with it and he's trying to figure out what it, um, what it is and what it does. And hopefully it has some answers for him, which he doesn't find out until later in the film. It's, it's a cool, like cut how we have, him messing with his glasses and you hear Jonathan and Martha kind of talking about his eyes and he's got these glasses and we talk about how like they're supposed to protect him and stuff and then it cuts to him putting his glasses on getting ready for work all right but you can you can probably picture like the things that he's dealing with with his eyes like he, he's had the, you know, he's had like your man of steel, like x-ray vision flashes and, you know, the random heat vision, um, that might've started up, you know, and, and the glasses, like maybe he's using the glasses to kind of hide behind them for, for those reasons that they're, they're, uh, a mental, um, form of protection for him, for, for what he's experiencing. Can I say that I laughed a lot that he's video messaging his parents to tie a tie because I laughed because my buddy Chase, who listeners may have heard on a uh, previous episode that I re-released because Chase and I were supposed to discuss the Batman trailer and he's been busy so we haven't got to. Um, one time we were at his house, we had some friends and I from college, we went to help him lead music at his church. And we were getting ready, and I came downstairs, and he was watching How to Tie a Tie on YouTube. Uh, so seeing Superman doing this, I was like, ah, Chase. Nice. Nice. I can't even I'm, – I'm not even sure that I remember what age. Uh, I'm fairly certain I probably learned how to tie a tie in high school, but not what for. Um, I always forget one step. Like, there's one flip that I forget, so, like, my ties are either, like, really long, or I screw up, and, like, it just, because I don't... And you got to undo it and do it again. <laughs> yeah, I don't do it enough, so I just got to the point now where I tie them, and I just leave them tied. Yeah. I still have to, I still have to think about it when I do it, because I don't tie a tie every day. It's not like I wear a tie to work or anything. So, um, when I do put one on and I start to tie it, I got to, you know... I gotta line it up. And I'm like, okay, here, here, through there. Okay, yeah, that's right. And <laughs> but so we see that, and he's talking about, I gotta go to the planet, you know, the launch. I'm part of the team, big deal. And he takes off, and we're like, all right, Clark's working for the planet. And this is a big first change, which I really like. Clark is basically like an intern, um, copy boy, coffee boy, whatever you want to call it. He's got the coffee, and they say, hey, coffee boy, and he shows up. And um, that's where our joke came from about the cinnamon is he talks about – he's talking to Mr. Troop, and he says, I had him add some cinnamon. It really helps liven the grounds up. Yeah, yeah. He said, I, have, I had him add cinnamon to the grounds. I, I, think it really, I think it really wakes him up. And he gives him the coffee, and he gives everybody else their coffee, and then the whole um, – Lex thing happens, which I'll turn back around on here in a second, but then he goes up to um, Rudy Jones, who's a janitor for Star Labs at this time, and he's uh, he gives him his coffee, and Rudy takes a, a drink of the coffee, and he's like, oh, the cinnamon really wakes it up, and he's like, I thought the same thing, so it was a, it was a nice little joke in that opening, se in that in that sequence, wow. that, intro that opening adult sequence there. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I didn't know that you would do 
I just I like that we meet Rudy here like that, and I feel like as the film progresses, I wish there was a couple more type scenes where we get one scene of kind of Rudy with his, trying to fight his humanity, and I kind of wish that we had gotten a little bit more. And I have a question to pose to you when we get towards the end, because watching it a second time, I kind of had a different thought. Um, but yeah, I just um, I thought that was pretty funny, and then we have Lex. Basically, announcing all this, um, he's about to make this launch and what's going to happen, and Lois shows up, and basically, we find out she's just a journalism grad student who won a scholarship, and had won a Lex scholarship, a Luther Corp scholarship, and she basically, we find out, points out that Lex just basically sabotaged and set up the program to fail from a government contract. <laughs> Yeah, which how she got the how she got the um, the recording of him is pretty. I mean, they don't say how she did it, so I mean that's interesting, you know, given the fact that it's like you said it's government contract and. Yeah, it was like all off screen, and I you know this film. Okay, I'm gonna say this right now. I like this film because much like the book of Secret Origins. And even this film is more so, it's small. It's not Superman taking on a huge army. It's not some elaborate thing. It's a really great modern origin tale of bringing Superman out and Clark becoming Superman. And I really appreciate this film for that. And, and I like how the rocket ship goes off and fly and, and, and just Clark gets the rocket ship. Right. When when Lex launches the, sh the space shuttle and then it's flying and we hear, look up in the sky. And it's actually them talking about the space shuttle and it's falling apart. And then Clark takes off and he's wearing just like a jacket and a, a pair of like goggles. And Lex is like, crap. And Clark saves it, you know, and... Lex gets arrested, which is awesome. <laughs> but everyone calls him the Flying Man, which is a lot cooler than the Blur. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 or you guys can call him, like, 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 um, Superman. And this is really the scene where he, he puts the rocket into space that he realizes that he is powered... By the sun. Because, like, he's standing in f close to the sun and, like, he's energized. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. Like, because he, he just, all he is, all he's concentrated on is, is getting the rocket away from the city and, and back up out into the, out into space or, or, uh, up into the air. And he flies up with it. And when he when he releases it, then he turns around. He kind of looks like he seems he seems to be stunned that he's like in space, that he, like like he can see the curvature of the Earth and everything. Yeah, um, it's it's and, really a great moment. It makes me feel like that's the first time he's ever flown that into high. outer space. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's what it makes me feel like too. And <clears throat> he um he's up there, and then. He is, he's, and he looks at the sun and he can start to like feel it. And I was like, that's really cool, you know, because like he's outside of the atmosphere. He's beyond the clouds and beyond, beyond our air and, and our atmosphere. And he's getting like the full force of the sun's radiation on him in space without anything blocking, anything being in the way. So this is kind of like the first time too that he realizes like how the sun is really charging him and and powering him up. And it's it's just a subtle easy way of him doing that without it being like too over the head. Um I was going to say this a minute ago is I really like how bright this film is. Like just everything is bright. Metropolis as we go through it really looks like a futuristic city. Like the city of tomorrow, which is what I really like. Like the, 
Kind of yeah. like the animated series did. Yes, which I'd love to see more in a live action. Like, um, <clears throat> I said, it'd be kind of interesting to film, like, for like your major city, like your skyline and stuff, using like Dubai and stuff like that, where it's really different architecture. Um, and then like digitally clean it up and like add things and change things to make it feel like a city, an American city, but really making it feel like something else right what are you doing You're not supposed to have um down here. yeah the the city was pretty cool um it's it's kind of <laughs> cool uh and then and then the next thing they they go into the daily planet um and that's where okay. perry white reveals um lois lane to be uh to be a, a new recruit um reporter uh, that she's that she's uh, part of the team um, that because uh, and that she was a grad student and she wasn't a reporter before then, at least, you know, uh, employed by the planet. So and and I really liked Perry White's uh, um, glad Perry Good. White. They all hate you. <laughs> yeah, like that couldn't have gone that couldn't have gone better. <laughs> um, no, like what you're saying, like yeah, she was a grad student and. It's this story is really kind of Lois and Clark coming up together, but she's just like one step ahead of him, you know. Instead of being like she's been a reporter, um, big time already, and Clark's coming into the fold, this is really is just her being one step ahead of Clark. Yeah, I mean, she comes out the gate extremely strong by taking down freaking billionaire Lex Luthor um, in, in the in the the space scandal. Um, but you know, so she, she is a reporter and she is, she is one or two steps farther along than, um, uh, Clark, but definitely, um, cut her teeth with a, with a great story and, um, like got, got her name probably national and worldwide, uh, right out the gate. Like, so that would make. That would that would make Lois Lane this very um, tenacious and and um, big name to look out for coming up, you know, because she took down one of the biggest <laughs> one of the biggest scandals ever. <laughs> well, as, Cl as Clark says, the big, the most powerful person on the planet. Now we get our the first time that Lois and Clark interact is in the copy room, and Solomon. Well, that's what, interest. What well, that's picture? interesting though. That's interesting, though, that, that he says the most powerful person on the planet with, you know, knowing what he can do himself. He doesn't consider himself the most powerful person on the planet. This Clark, this version of Clark Superman is very humble, and I like that. Um, Solomon, why don't you tell James and everybody listening, what, what picture did Lois have with all of her papers? Who else was there? Uh, that... She had a Batman picture. And that's just, I thought that was really cool. So, yeah, with a uh, with a post-it on it too that said "nice cape." <laughs> and I think that's kind of funny because that's where they get the idea for the cape. <laughs> well, what's interesting is, oh, go ahead, go no, ahead. No, with, I was going to say, Witcher. just keeping with that thread. Later, Martha makes the reference of seeing the pictures of Batman from the tabloids and that she thinks capes are cool. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to bring up, too, is, I mean, it's the same thing. It's the same conversation. Um, she says that, she says, I got the idea from that nice Batman guy I always see at the, at the checkout. Like, so this, this isn't, this isn't the version of Batman where we get in the animated series where she's like, she's like, nobody, we don't want them to confuse you with that crazy Batman guy from Gotham City or whatever, you know, like... So when and if we get a Batman that exists in this same world, like, how's he going to be in comparison and in comparison to what we've got to Batman from before? Um, something else we didn't <clears throat> mention, um, I wanted to mention with Rudy, was uh, Rudy's talking about Star Labs, and he's bringing up a couple – he just brings up a couple of things. He brings up um, – uh, super speed 
because he's talking about uh, how Star Labs is researching all the things that we are are hearing about now. And he brings up super speed. I think he brings up super strength, and he says all this alien stuff. So right. I think they had a reference to the Flash. So I think most of the heroes in this in this world, they obviously are expanding, or maybe they have an idea to expand. But even though this is this movie is only focused on Superman and in Metropolis, they're not bringing anybody in. But they did drop a couple of minor hints. And that picture of Batman, you know, a couple of minor hints that there is other things and other people and other heroes out there. Which which was going to be my question to you is, without going into a lot of you, do you think that this is the film that you would want to start a new, maybe a new continuity? Um, <clears throat> I, I would say the way that it was all done um, – the introduction of Batman, just like a couple of little Easter eggs, a couple of little hints. They brought in Martian Manhunter. They did discuss the cosmic side because they brought in Lobo. He talked about Kryptonians and Zarnians and Martians. Um, so they did kind of open up the idea of the cosmic side. Um, I think it would be pretty cool if they use this to 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 springboard more more characters focus on the cent focus on those characters um in their own films their own stories and same thing just drop a couple little easter eggs like the next movie being you know a batman movie or or a flash movie i'd say and, a flash movie. you know I'd yeah say the, a flash i want movie the in this universe we've had plenty of batman I, I, I say in the this flash. universe but like you said, just little Easter eggs. And, like, I I like the tone of this film. I, and it's a nice, like, you know, how the other continuity was really dark. This is bright. Um, and I like the idea of continuity. It wasn't dark. It was just, it was serious, you know. They they, they had more of a serious tone, I, mean, I would yeah, say. Yeah, but I mean, even, like, the colors I mean, <clears throat> were, were darker. Like, this is a very vibrant, you know. Yeah. And we haven't had, we don't have a, you know animated series or anything the closest we have is young justice um that hopefully we'll hear about at fandom so it'd be great um now to jump back into where we are in the film at least the um at least the subtitle of what season four young justice is going to be yes and in that batman is a little bit my he's my he's my favorite <laughs> yeah, I mean, just real quick before we dive back in, I am hoping because Young Justice season three ended over a year ago. Um, I, I feel like, anyways, yes. I'm pretty sure I'm I'm pretty close. Uh, yeah. Um, well, because because th this month is two years for DC Universe, and Young Justice was one of the early things they used in early. Yeah, so it has been over a year since Young Justice Season 3 was done. So hopefully they've been – they're well into production on Season 4, and hopefully we'll get some information on that come this weekend. Crossing my fingers. Okay, back to the movie. <laughs> back to your regularly scheduled programming. So Lobo shows up, and here's the one mystery after watching it twice – we don't know who hired and sent Lobo. Because they said there's a bounty on the last Kryptonian. And Lobo's just as, su as surprised to be there that Clark, um, you know, has powers. Because, you know, he says, are you sure you're from Krypton? And he go Clark goes, Kansas, actually. And he's like, well, something in Kansas has made you strong. Right. And so we don't know who sent Lobo, like who put the bounty on the last Kryptonian. Yep. Um, yeah, that is interesting. Um, um, 
just just the whole uh, Lobo interaction, the the fight. You know, he he comes in. It's on it's on the the news that something's heading for Earth, um, and uh, Superman flies up to to intercept, and and it ends up being Lobo. And yeah, he's he's talking to him about. Um, he calls him a Kryptonian. He doesn't even know what a Kryptonian is. He um, <clears throat> he lets uh, or he says, "I've never I've never met a flying Kryptonian." And yeah, and then they, and then they get into and then they get into their fight. Exactly. And this is the first time that Clark had heard the term Kryptonian. Like he's like, what? He's like, hey, I ain't never seen no flying Kryptonian. And Clark's like, uh, squeeze me? Baking powder? Kryptonian? What? <laughs> um, so I found, I just found that interesting. You know, uh, the fact that this was Clark's first time hearing that name. And now as, the, you know, he'll hear it again later from uh, Martian Manhunter. But this is his first time hearing it. And it's it's just interesting, you know? That the first time he hears it is when he's being hunted by Lobo. So. so they get into a pretty they get into a pretty um uh knockdown drag out fight here. Um uh, they they go from building to building. I mean, it's it's pretty intense. They're uh, they're doing they're causing some damage, um, some structural damage. Um, they they go. I mean, they're they're flying through the air. They're crashing into the ground. Um, Superman's reentry burns off all of his clothes. That part was hilarious because both the kids are like, Ugh, "Don't do that." <laughs> Don't want to see his <laughs> yeah. butt. Superman's naked. Yeah, both um, kids were like, "No, Daddy, that's dumb." <laughs> so, um, Lobo gets the only like real language in the movie, as it should um, be. As it yeah. should be. Um, he's definitely the character for it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, and the fight was pretty cool. Like. You know, Superman's fighting him. He knees him in the face, and then he smashes his head into the ground. And like, like he smashes his head into the ground so hard, like the the parking lot just obliterates. Yeah, like, <laughs> like it's a it's a pretty intense, super powered fight. And you have to um, you have to think that this is probably Clark's first time actually ever really fighting anyone with superpowers. Fighting any almost anyone, period. I mean, since the time he was like twelve years old, he could lift a tractor with one finger. I mean, like, which, which so be dope, but you know, yeah. Which so it's like, you know, in in Smallville before, you know, before there were meteor freaks and and he had some powers, like they wouldn't let him do anything. In Man of Steel, when kids are bullying him, he has to hold back because he knows what he can do he can't do anything because you know potentially he could kill somebody like one punch and these people could turn into a red mist <laughs> uh, so <laughs> this is true um, you're right you're yeah. absolutely right so so he's never ha he's never fought anybody before more more than likely you know so he did pretty good <laughs> i mean yeah um, I do like how he, you know, like you said, he, when he flies down on the re-entry, he stops right above Lobo and goes, you're right, this was the more fun part, and then just pops him in the face. Yeah, yeah, knocks him out. Um, I do like that Lobo pulls out a machine gun that shoots knives. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. I was, and he has a place on his bike that pops out cigars. Yeah, and he also had, like, a storage of, like, electric alien leeches or something. Yeah, and Clark's using his heat vision to to not, you know, get rid of them and I mean, and what's interesting about the fight 
is during the fight, Lobo has a kryptonite ring. Why does Lobo have a kryptonite ring? That was interesting. Um, and he did say, oh, what did he say? Um, he says that your planet was the reason for like destroyed or whatever. I thought that it was, you know, it was your destruction, something like that. Yeah, but um, he actually like, 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 like he wanted it. You know what I mean? It's it made it sound like he he went and and took a chunk of Krypton and and carved a ring out of it. Right. Like like the idea that. Kryptonians were responsible for their own destruction. That the you know from from his perspective, the fact that he destroyed his entire race, and that Kryptonians did the same thing. They they destroyed themselves. Like in his twisted mind, it seems like that was something that he would like because they destroyed themselves. I'm gonna get a piece of Krypton and have it as a friggin' piece of jewelry. Right. You know, because there's no reason for him to be like, oh, kryptonite, krypton, you know, this is going to hurt you. Um, like it, it was he, he didn't act like surprised when it was when it weakened him, when it affected him or anything. But he um, but he also didn't act like, yeah, well, makes sense that this is that, you know, that this would do this to you. It was very interesting. That's all I'm going to say. It was just very interesting that that happened. Now, but they bring it back around for a couple of reasons later on, too. They do. And it's interesting that is there kryptonite on Earth? That's a question that we ask because Lobo brought that with him. And it doesn't right. seem like Clark has ever encountered any kryptonite until that moment with Lobo. Yeah. Well, in this version, we don't know, is this a, is this a version um, like Richard Donner, where Clark, Clark flew through space and chunks of Krypton made it there? Or is this like Man of Steel, where it would have to be like created? Because because he was sent through a portal, you know, and... and uh, from the other side of the galaxy and a chunk in the chunks of Krypton, you know, didn't come with him at the same time. So what were you asking, Solo? All right, Solo, what do you want to say? A parasite turned really big, like you just all kinds of spikes. Yeah. Which is a, a interesting way that parasites created from a grenade that Lobo throws that explodes in Star Labs with like a purple energy sunking goo that you know molds with Rudy yeah that was it was interesting the way the um and that and that's um, how you know parasite is a you know created yeah um created from that yeah that alien that alien goo um they they did kind of give like some sort of little explanation as from Lex's perspective he gave some sort of explanation um, but it was kind of just it was just kind of off of his head you know there was no research done on it um, uh, on parasite or anything um, it did when parasite does grow I was like and when they did a close-up of the face and everything I was like man I was like it's Godzilla like and it looked just like that Godzilla film um, from 1998. Yep. Like the mouth, the chin, and everything. I was like, man, that thing looks just like Godzilla from, you know, from that 90s movie. <laughs> the Americanized Godzilla. Yeah. No, you, I mean, you're exactly correct, because I even have that in my notes. Like, is that because what's interesting is so going a little discussion here about Parasite for a second. We've seen Parasite in different animation. Uh, haven't seen him recently in any of these films. Um, he, you know, he starts out very human. Um, and he looks just like kind of a diseased man. Kind of remind me a little bit about how uh, Blight looked in Batman Beyond with like the, 
when he was sick with like the patches and stuff of skin. And Solomon, you know, he really hated like when Parasite would touch people and like absorb all their energy. They'd look like dried zombies. Yeah, they, they'd look like mummified people. Um, but then once he got to Lobo's cage and like he attacked Lobo's cage and he hit that, that's where like it was the catalyst to start to turn him more like the lizard looking creature. And then from that point on, the more energy he got, um, because, you know, I thought about, well, maybe it was because he touched the aliens, um, but it was like he touched the energy around Lobo's cage, and then from then on, when he got more energy, he kept getting more and more, like, monstery. Right. Well, it was like an, the, so it was an alien goo that, that had changed him into what he became, into the parasite. So, like, yeah, the more energy he absorbed, and it was that high-voltage electricity from that cage that he was absorbing that eventually did, yeah, change him into that, I don't know, reptilian or xenomorph-looking creature. Yeah, it's like a hybrid between, like, xenomorph and Godzilla is what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, like, it. The, the, only, the only thing that... I, I I just went with it, you know, the transformation and stuff yeah, all the so, way so to the I. end. Yeah, I mean, so, um, so the one I. thing I didn't like was how it changed his legs to freaking little peg legs. He was yes. running on little peg legs instead of like changing his feet into some kind of amphibious or amphibious reptilian style <laughs> foot where the where the heel is up, you know, yeah. kind of thing. He running on the toes, that type of thing. Change it into some kind of just like. Little little peg legs sticking down. I was like, that's weird. Yes, <laughs> like that was not that was a terrible animation choice right there. Um, I noticed that more the second time watching it, and I was not happy with that. Um, okay, so one thing during the fight that helps bring Lobo down, we hadn't mentioned yet, was Martian Manhunter sh shows up. And he had been tailing Clark in his human Sean Jones form. And he shows up and reveals himself, but he reveals himself in his straight Martian form. Not his more humanoid Martian form, but like his actual Martian form. And I thought that was interesting and odd at the same time. But he says later that it was to try to gift Clark time and to offer Lobo something of equal value, being that Jean perceives himself as the last Martian. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, Jean Jones' characterization in this in this movie was, was pretty spot on, I feel. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I loved it. And um, I thought it was great. I thought that they could have gave us I looked that's who Clark is with like they paired them to kind of together to tell this story um, Solomon told me today that that should have been called Superman versus Parasite and not Superman Man of Tomorrow he didn't like that um, mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of funny um, but <laughs> Well, everything's not everything's not the person versus person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all not, not everybody fights. Um, um <clears throat> the uh, I did like Martian Manhunter. Like I said his his portrayal was spot on. Um, I uh, I, I like how he interacted with Clark and his family. Um. The interaction with Lobo, um, how he, I, I thought, I was like, why are they gonna, why are they gonna incinerate him in, in the first, in his first appearance, you know, when, um, Parasite used heat vision and like part of it was a, was a, um, psychic projection. So that way he could, um, recover, um, which, which is what he explains later on after he shows up again. Um, yeah, that's I mean, I, I literally was like, I literally stopped and was like, no. Right. 
Um, so what did you think? What did you think about the the super suit? Um, the suit, how it was created. Um, so I, I like the whole Martha uh, loving the cape, and she put the cape on it. Because earlier we saw the scene where Clark was, tr- you know, he tried on like a his sheet his, as a cape in his room. Right, right after he saw the picture of Batman with the post-it on it that said "nice cape." And then when he flew out, like the, it came off. Um, you know, it does go back to being Martha that creates it with the blankets, and they say they went through sixteen bandsaw blades to try to cut the material, and she hopes that you know, with all his activity, because they can't afford to keep buying him nice clothes for him to tear up. Yeah, um, which I like. I like that. You know, we went through sixteen bandsaw blades. Like, like that's a that's a lot of blades to cut fabric. You know, so she's like, may she's like maybe I don't know if it'll hold up to what you're gonna put it through, but <laughs> like it it burned up sixteen blades. So you know, it'll withstand quite a bit. <laughs> so I'm cool with it. I mean, that seems to be like. Everyone's favorite is his mom made it for him, which is fine. Um, it's fine as long, uh, to, in my opinion. I mean, you know, the the kind of the idea of the bioelectric aura is is an old school idea. Um, so it's 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 like how it, okay sure if even if that was the case of bioelectric aura and his clothes are fine wouldn't he have to replace his cape constantly from getting burned up from getting torn up to shreds like you know what i mean it's not like he has a bubble around him um so i i like the idea i'm okay with the idea that it's kryptonian fabric that it's an alien fabric and and it yeah. can withstand you know that that just uh, that just the clothing itself could withstand the um, anything that we can throw at it on Earth. You know what I mean? Like a freaking nuclear bomb can't destroy the clothing. You know. Um, right. So the fact that the material is still alien, it's okay that Martha made it. You know that it's not a Kryptonian suit given to him. That it's not. Kryptonian armor that he found, uh, what on Brainiac ship or something from the new 52, like, you know what I mean? It's still alien clothing. It was just his mother made it for him. It's a, it's a blend of alien material with Martha's good sense of sewing. Um, yeah, Martha's, uh, homegrown sensibilities. (laughs) So which, which in that same vein, the S goes back to meaning S for Superman. Because, you know, Lois Lane, well, same, Luther says, what's the S for? And he says, Superman. Well, yeah, I mean, and also we didn't get, like, um, we, we didn't get very much interaction um, with him learning about his past at all. Um, there, was, there was some, but very little. Um, and it wasn't, like... This is our family crest. This stands for this or that. He saw it. He saw the crest. He saw what it was. Um, you know, he learned about what happened to Krypton, kind of, and, and that his parents, you know, set, sent him away and saved his life. And then that was it. So, I mean, to him, really, it's still it's still an S, and, and Lois gave him the name of Superman, so... Yeah, I mean, to him now at this point, it stands for uh, it's an S that stands for Superman, which I like. I'm I'm cool with you know like let it evolve, let the story because like this very much is a great. He doesn't know who he is yet. He get well, which follows the vein of Man of Steel. In Man of Steel, he had no clue who he was until he found that Kryptonian scout ship. You know. All he knew was he was an alien, and in this, that's all he knows until Marsh until Lobo tells him he's a Kryptonian, and Martian Manhunter activates his little pyramid cube, his little pyramid, um, um, whatever. I love when, I love when uh, he shows up, and Martha's like, "Well, if John's staying, there's sheets in the cup in the hallway." Cat. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just like, all right. Mama Martha, good job. Right. It's, it's so homely. You love it. 
Yeah. Um, it, it's, it is. It's a very good um, – this movie is a very good blend of, like, everything we've almost, almost – a, a lot of things we've gotten to this point of Superman, you know, including, like, I've, you know, I've brought up these similarities to Man of Steel and stuff. <laughs> like, um, I, I it's, just... it's a very good – blend of some of these things that have come up it's like the perfect way to reintroduce the character for a new generation right yeah yeah it is a very good introduction and and like you said it, it's the way that it the way that it the story developed um there's so much room for it to grow and evolve there's no jimmy olsen you know like clark kind of was taking that role and you know um uh, Maybe potentially, like, Jimmy get tired if they do a sequel because Clark's moved on from being Coffee Boy. Um, yeah, he's now a full-fledged reporter, and now we got this young intern photographer, Coffee Boy, who's Jimmy Olsen. Um, let's see. Let's move. we kind of been hopping around, but basically um, Clark has his <coughs> battle with Parasite, you know, after he gets his costume, he gets his powers taken. Uh, we talked about, like, with Martian Manhunter. Um, uh, See, now, this – well, with this story, the, his interaction with Lois. So there hasn't been – he doesn't interact with Lois a whole lot as Clark or a whole lot as Superman. He does He does a little bit as, of both. Um, but the, the interaction she comes up against with Clark is his hand is cut open by the glass. Like, so she has no reason to believe or speculate that he's anything other than Clark Kent. Which I like that scene. Like, she busts into his, um, he wakes up, you know, the day after. She, they find out that he had, you know, was on the scene and had given a statement to the police. She comes to check on him slash fire him is how she yeah. puts it from Perry because he didn't show up. Um, and yeah, he had cut Which his Which is hand. nice, but she's like, I think I got the translation right. <laughs> um, you know, and it's kind of this weird thing where she like wants to share the story with him. And he's like, are you trying to steal my story? And she's like, no, I want to share the byline with you. And, you know, she gives this whole speech about looking for someone who knows more to help you. Um, and that inspires Clark to go to Lex to, for help to fight Parasite. Um... So, you know, it's a really cool scene, you know, and like them two kind of, like you said, connecting a little bit more. Um, and I think it's very true to Lois. You know, she's very strong, but yet at the same time, uh, very much in this isolated and alienated just because it seems like nobody else wants to deal with her. Yeah. At the planet. So, so, so I mean, it's... <sighs> You know how – I mean I've, I've spoken about how I think um, these days the idea that she couldn't – that she, she works in a desk across from him all day long and they work together out in the field all day long. Um, and, then, and then she comes face-to-face -face with Superman on such a regular occurrence. Like it's a disservice to the character that she doesn't know – that she doesn't realize that he's – um, that they're one and the same for so long. Right. You know? I mean, they even had to admit so, in the comics that, you know, um, the glasses were Kryptonian, made that gave a low hypnosis that people who saw Clark were like under this like light hypnosis, so he looked different. Um, exactly. Um, so, like. Like Man of Steel, the idea was for her to find out who he was right away. Okay. So, like in this, they they kind of they run them parallel and they run they just they're just close, you know. But I think like if we were to if we were to make a sequel, this isn't this isn't quite like even like Superman the movie, and then go to Superman two where in the sequel she finds out who he is, you know. I'm not kind of like running those parallels to it, but. I think that if they were to write it, I think they would actually make it very natural and, and organic um, and, and not do like three, four movies or something like that where Lois doesn't know he's Superman. Right. You know, I, I just I don't think I think that 
trope is old school and it's just it's a disservice to the character now. I like that like she's that in on it. Girl. It gives her more to do. Exactly. Uh, um, especially, like you said, once they start interacting more. Like, uh, she didn't even get her interview in this. Which I in, love. In this movie, she didn't even get her interview, which, which every other interpretation, she gets an interview right out the gate. He wants to do the interview, but He's messing this with or that, he has to leave. Well, I mean, she, she talks about, you know, she's supposed to have an interview. She's like, right now, this, she's talking to Clark, saying, the Superman's on the roof waiting for me to do this interview. It's a power move. I'll have to cancel. And then, you know, he'll be begging me to reschedule. And then she talks about going to interview Lobo. Well, then at the end, she comes up all the stairs, and there's Martian Manhunter and, Cl and Superman talking. You know, Martian Manhunter leaves. Superman says, uh, I have to go, Miss Lane. We'll have to reschedule. And he flies off. And then she he comes down. the power move on her. <laughs> and she comes, she comes downstairs, and she's, like, panting, goes to her desk, says, where's my calendar? Says something to, to Clark because he because there's a beautiful scene of it's like you see Lois like from behind Lois see Superman fly by the window. The camera then turns. You, we're looking at Lois and then the door behind her Clark appears and asks how her interview went. And she says, um, you know, you know, that thing I told you about power moves. Well, yeah, they work. And then she's like, you must see my planner. And then that's the end of the film. Like, that's where it ends. Um so I thought that was really unique. But as far as... The, the climactic battle? Yeah, we'll, we'll move it back to, uh, you know, Parasite. So let's, let's, before we get back to Parasite, Lex, you know, Clark gets Lex out. Lex, you know, immediately, like, is talking to him. He's like, oh, um, you're powered by the sun. Because Clark's talking about, you know, I need help getting up into space and the sun because I'm depowered. Um... And they're trying to figure out how to defeat Parasite. Um, there's a great quote in the, in the battle before uh, they go for the final climax I wanted to bring up is where Clark – Superman – got to use the terms right. Superman turns to Lois and says, you're right about my origins but not my intentions. Please, don't run your story. It should be me that tells it. I thought that was just a really great quote. Um, yeah. But I, I, I forgot to mention that. But anyways, so Lex is like he has a plan with Lobo and Superman how they're gonna go and defeat, uh, you know, Parasite. Basically, if Superman, you know, they're gonna use um, the weaknesses. Like anyone that he touches and absorbs, Parasite will absorb their weaknesses. So they have the Kryptonite ring that Luther puts up basically in a gun to shoot, and we find out that. Um, it only lasts for so long. Or no, I'm sorry. Reverse that. Lobo has the ring, goes up and starts just pounding Parasite in the head with the ring. And Lobo gets squeezed and crushed. And that's when they find out that the weaknesses only last for so long. With the power he absorbs. Um, Clark flies out there to give him, as he says, a weakness. So that Lex can go and... Um, take the ring from Lobo and that's where Lex puts it in his gun then basically decides what he wants to do <coughs> excuse me who he's going to turn on because you know Lex is only after himself yeah he's only out for himself yeah he, he uses the ring and he puts it in this magnet um, what did he call it um, magnetic amplifier or something like that and he, he amplifies the the radiation basically from the kryptonite ring and uses it to blast Superman. Like he tries to take the opportunity to take out Superman at the same time. Cause that's a very Luther. Lex move. Yeah. Um, so it's the, the fight is actually the, so, you know, we're kind of to the fight where we're with parasite again. Um, this version of parasite, like, they do express that there's like these limits, um, like time where he has the powers and where he has the, um, the weaknesses, but it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like he's becoming, um, weaker 
as time goes on because his his hunger for power is growing and his physical body um, is still massive yeah and, and he doesn't revert back so that was kind of a weird thing um i mean i thought it was weird the first time he transformed into this giant creature and they were fighting um but the fact that he continues to absorb and then grow and then how how the the battle ends i'm like well i guess if they're gonna do that in the end then you know it's okay that it that it went this way you know what i mean so you don't you don't find it until the end you don't find that out until the end so you're like so okay well. i have a question about the end here in a second so we have a really cool scene where, a super, where there's people on the bridge who are like throwing stuff yelling and lois is reporting and basically the the People's perception of Superman is human, and that Parasite is an alien. Mm -hmm. And Superman comes over and says, starts basically, no, this is Rudy Jones. This is a, he is, something happened to him, and this is, he is human. And he's like, I'm the alien. And he starts talking and explaining everything. And it's really great because we see some cutscenes of Rudy, like, as a combat veteran. He got the, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. And that's where I feel like we, we – I would have liked a little bit more time with Rudy because we also find out, like, he's got a daughter in first grade and another child on the way. Um, and it's just – it's very heartbreaking because we get that story. But – so in the final battle, you know, Clark starts talking to Rudy like, if you have absorbed my powers and my memories, you also absorb my heart. And he's trying, right. to, he's trying to appeal to him. And Parasite sees a, a woman and a daughter on the on the bridge that looks like his wife. Makes him think of his wife and daughter. And this got me thinking because they had a um, power plant, was a, a plant or whatever set to explode. And I, I think I think they end, yeah I think they ended up doing like a an overload an on over the plant and parasite uh, goes to absorb it and the second time I watched it because the first time I kept getting distracted because I have children um, the second time I took it and did you take it that parasite was going to stop it to protect everyone um. I, he he might have gone to try and yeah absorb the energy because if the plant were to explode it would you know who knows how much of how much uh, of Metropolis it would take with it and because if you go back and watch it <clears throat> because how I took the ending was Superman appeals to his heart about you have my heart Rudy this is not you this is who Rudy Jones is and. He sees the, that lady and her child, and he thinks about his family, and it's going to overload. So he goes to absorb the power to stop it, which is what causes him him to overload and die. And he basically, um, the, and, and the, the plant burns him up. Like, yeah, and he turns it, to like it, stone. Turn, well, he turns to ash. I mean, he it, it burns him up, and he it incinerates him he's just he's a giant statue of ash and then he and then it blows away and it was just it was just powerful <clears throat> and i was just like it was crazy that you know that because it also makes once again it's a very small film it's not really superman who goes out as so far as the physical champion but as the one who shows the strength of character and is able to have Parasite turn around and help save people. Um, and, of course, Lex tries to run away, but he gets nabbed by Martian Manhunter, which is awesome. Yeah. Well, that's one of – I mean, that's that's one of Superman's greatest powers is, you know, even though he can withstand anything and he can, um, you know, punch anything and anyone and, you know, I mean, the idea that Superman can do anything, his – Still, his his greatest power is his heart, his humanity. Um, it's, I mean, heck, it's what they use every season on Supergirl. She always appeals to everybody with a big speech. Yep. 
because it's cheap to film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. We need Supergirl to win. How? Just have her talk to everyone. Right. right. Awesome. That's cheap. And roll them. <laughs> right. Um, with, with that, uh, they, being they s- need to do a little bit more punching than they have. But yeah, <laughs> essentially, yes, that is the case. Um, with that being said, I just want to give a quick shout out. Um, I discovered a podcast that's called, and I'm pulling it up right now. Um, where'd it go? Uh, Voices from Krypton. There is a seven minute interview they did with Brandon Ralph. I highly recommend everyone check it out because just listening to him talk about the character, especially at the end is what makes him such a great person to embody the role that he understands Superman. Um, and I'm so glad that we got him again. But so, you know, that basically, you know, we kind of skipped around a lot in the film, but that basically sums up. Uh, well, what I what I wanted to film. what I wanted to bring up earlier, you were talking about Sela being your little Cara Danvers um, before before the very end. The three aliens are on the roof. Superman, Lobo, and Martian Manhunt are all together, and they're talking. They're having a conversation. Lobo talks about how being the last of something raises the bounty. You know, there's always the last of something, but it's never the case. Um, So uh, Jean uh, asks him and finds out that there's other Martians out there. And um, he even says that there may be one or two Kryptonians floating around out there. I mean, we could get, we could potentially get a Supergirl. We could get a Zod and, and some other things in this, in, in this version's film continuity. I, I thought about Argo city even, um, <clears throat> you know, something along those lines. Right. Cause I, like I said, Candor, I, Can- I like the bottle city of Candor. I mean, it's floating around. I like this yeah. version. I, would be completely okay with continuing this uh, film and having a sequel to it. If it doesn't, Definitely. if it's not a new continuity, just give me like a trilogy of this Superman and yeah. of this, you know, series, because I feel like they set up a really good. Yeah. And you know what you said trilogy. I think when you even think when, when people think and they say trilogy, I think it still limits you. You know what I mean? It does. As long as they keep coming out with compelling stories, give me four, five, six Superman movies in this same vein and give us more characters, more villains that we haven't seen um, um, in so long on screen or, or ever on screen. That's you why know I, what I mean? love that they did Parasite. He's such a, a, a um, easy villain to do but has a very strong story. And especially for a Superman first starting out, like, oh, yeah, because I I meant to mention this. On the bridge, Parasite goes to punch, like, the bridge and destroy it. And Superman flies and stops his fist, which, of course, you know, he's touching Parasite and causes him to, um, you know, be drained. Um, And it would just show that he was putting himself out there to save people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, I enjoyed this movie. Um, I am going to be picking it up on Tuesday, um, my physical copy, and uh, I will be watching it again and even paying more close attention. I mean, the first time I watched it, um, you know, same thing. I got kids. Mine are still, mine are, they're not as young as yours, but mine are still young and they still need me for things. And um, so, like, same thing, both both times I watched it, um, I didn't get to just 100% sit there and, and watch it from... So I'm sure I'm missing something here or there. Yeah, I think we covered so. it pretty good, but... I'm sure there'll um, be more that will fester. Yeah, so... That's a high recommend. I'm definitely looking to check... Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely looking to check it out again this week later on this week after I pick it up on Tuesday. I give it an eight. And I think mainly I give it an eight because I just, I'd, I'd give it a nine if, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there were some uh, things that were done differently on the parasite side 
Like, but other than that, yeah, it's a solid like eight, eight point five. I love everything with Superman. Oh yeah, and, and it's this a great origin story. Um, tons of room to evolve. They really nailed the character. Um, you know, they really nailed a lot of the characters. The cast was great. The story was good. Um, the the route that they took with Parasite, like I said early on, and especially when he first grew into Parasite, I was like, I was like, I don't like this, you know. Um, but then come the end, when you know when he does that and he gets incinerated, um, I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense that if this is the route that he's going, he's becoming this powerful, he's doing this, he's growing. And, you know, there's no reverting back. Like, it makes sense that they went this way. And I, I kind of, uh, I backed off of it that I was like, no, I don't like this. I was like, it's, I, I accept this. Yes. I agree. And, um, like I said, also, it's very interesting that uh, we don't know who sent Lobo. So that's, yeah, yeah. There's still, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's still more out there. there. There's a mystery left. That, there's a mystery left on the ground here that um, could be further explained in a sequel. Loba makes the joke like, "I killed all my people," and then he goes, "Nah." Yeah, <laughs> throughout the entire movie, there's a, uh, you know, through line of kind of him being kind of an unreliable narrator. Um. And he'll say something that we kind of usually know that uh, is true, but then he'll be like, nah. Or he'll say something that is completely false. Uh, so it's very interesting. Very interesting. Like, um, when he said nah, I was like, okay, Lobo, at that point I was like, Lobo's not one to back off. He fully owns that he incinerate you know that he destroyed his entire civilization like that's something lobo owns up to um so why he went nah and everything i was like oh like why why did they do that you yeah, know maybe they just don't want that dark of a lobo character where like like you said they want to move him in more of an anti-heroish and if he's that evil preceded by people uh I mean, unless unless they just, well, I don't know. Like I said, he's not one to hide it. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. Like, even un unless unless he's doing it for a deceptive reason, you know, I don't know why they would have chose for him to backtrack on on that because that's kind of like a mainstay of his character. Like, he, he killed his entire race when he was a child. Like. <laughs> it's messed up. But yeah. Like, he's, right. been, he's been this way his entire life. That's his character. <laughs> Any other final thoughts? Uh, no. Pick it up. Watch it. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep DC going with this new line of, of feature films. Yeah, don't, don't wait for it to drop on DC Universe. Support this, because... We don't know what the future holds. Well, who knows? Like how we didn't get our we didn't get our announcement that I can recall um, about DC Universe and the future of DC Universe because we know the original content is going over to HBO Max. That should probably um, hopefully we'll did. learn something at Fandom this week. Hopefully, because they they did say that DC Universe is not going away. But the original content is moving over to HBO Max, which it makes sense. It gets more eyes on, on the stuff because, let's face it, DC Universe is a, a niche service. I just want to know but, about the old stuff. But like, because... Will Superboy and stuff like that be over there on HBO Max? Because, right. you know, I'm making my way through the old Superboy show, and I... Uh, but... Well... We know that we know that the reason, part of the reason, um, DC Universe isn't worldwide is because of the legalities when it comes to um, 
streaming rights for all these different properties, movies and TV shows in different countries. Like, like the, it, the, the streaming rights, that's kind of, that's a, that's a weird whole freaking web of, of nut stuff. Um, so that's part of the reason why it didn't open up, but the fact that they added so many comics to it, that it's such an amazing comic reader. Um, it, it rivals Marvel unlimited. And I think that if they move everything streaming away from DC universe and put it all on HBO max, um, it will open that up to be able to be DC's comic reader uh, and and keep the price point because it's well worth it. Oh yeah, um, just for the comics alone. Two two. If you buy two brand new comics a month, you're paying for your DC universe. Yeah, and and just like Marvel Unlimited, you know, it's so many months behind. I think Marvel Unlimited is six months behind, and I think DC Universe is a year behind um, in in its comics that they put up. But, um, which is fine. I mean, you know, people, people are still paying, people are still reading. Um, I definitely think that it needs to, I, I do, it needs to open up to the rest of the world. Um, and if it's just a comic reader, I'm okay with that. And I will not cancel it. I will continue to be a DC universe and an HBO max subscriber. I agree. Um, so, you know, those, this movie who knows if it's even planned to go to DC Universe um, or HBO Max when that happens. Um, I am still planning on continuing to buy all of these animated films in physical form and using my digital code just like I have been. Nothing's going to change there. Yep. I like having my physical copy because... Just like the other day, they were repairing my internet, and it was out for six hours. And it was great to have physical media to pop in and watch. So mm -hmm. that's I James agree. and I stand behind the power of physical media. Um, so remember, Absolutely. everyone, keep your copies because <laughs> I don't want to get into a whole battle. But, you know, somebody explained it once like, <clears throat> you don't own the digital copy when you buy something. You can't because you can't pull it from like – you don't download a file that you have when you purchase like digitally. You have – you purchase the access to a digital file. So it's not like I can download it and then uh, have that – like I can pull it from my iTunes or wherever. And then if I want to share it or if I want to uh, – you know, edit or whatever, like it's locked, you know, I, and it's not a file that I can actually use like with, um, right. And I have to play it through only certain specific, you know, means. Yeah. Certain avenues. So you're basically paying for an access to a digital file, but that's neither here nor there. So Superman man of tomorrow, go check it out. Shoot us your response, get ready for fandom and, it's coming the 12th, and remember. Look up in the sky. Look up in the sky. Look in the sky.